is Go Beyond, the teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center. in an act of submission in an act of worship just as a sign to say I'm yours Lord today and forever
my favorite part. <laughs> oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. Woo. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes, Lord. Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on. Come on, look at the building. Lift your voice. Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give our God a praise here. So this morning, we are continuing our study of the Feast of the Lord. And this morning, we are going to specifically look at the Feast of First Fruits. Somebody say First Fruits. Now, First Fruits is a part of the entire Passover celebration. And if we could get that uh, slide up there, the week of Passover, I just kind of want get, to get us a running into the feast of first fruits. And we know that, uh, and we're following the slide, that on Sunday, Nisan the 10th, which was a Sunday, Nisan 10, we know that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. That was the first time he was recognized as the king of Israel. Remember, everybody shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Then seven days later, you know, those same people that, I'll put in quotations, praised him, crucified him. How many of you know today there's a lot of people that praise God with their mouth, but then there's going to be a time they will say crucify him. Amen? So we see that that's the first time that Jesus was recognized as the king of Israel. And then according to Exodus chapter 12, on the 10th day of the month, the 10th day of Nisan, the Jews were to select a lamb and keep it until the 14th day. Uh, they were to keep that uh, lamb for 14th day, and then that would be Passover. And that's when they would slaughter their lamb. But in those 10, or I'm sorry, from the 10th to the 14th, in those four days, the Jews would be inspecting the lambs. They had to make sure that their lamb was without blemish, without blemish. And we know for those four days, beginning on the 10th of Nisan to the 14th of Nisan, Jesus Christ was inspected. He was scrutinized up and down by the religious 
order of the day by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priesthood and even non-Jewish people. And they, they would try to trick him and, and trip him up. But how many of you know that Jesus was found to be the perfect lamb of God. He was found to be without spot or wrinkle. He was found to be the unblemished lamb of God, worthy to be sacrificed for our sin. Come on, somebody. So on the 14th day, they were to slaughter their lamb at twilight, according to Exodus chapter 12. Jesus was slaughtered at just as uh, it was prescribed by the Lord in Exodus chapter 12. At the 12 o'clock hour, at the noon hour, or the sixth hour of the day, while the priest was binding the horns of the lamb to the altar, Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God, was being bound to another altar called the old rugged cross. Amen? And, 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 and then, then three hours later, the Bible says the earth was covered with darkness. And then at the three hours later, Jesus Christ hung on that cross. And while the high priest would slaughter the last lamb of Israel, stating that Passover was officially over. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm going to preach. It, uh, the, the, the Passover was officially over. Jesus Christ hung on that cross, stretched out his arms, and in his last breath, he stated, it huh, is finished. Listen to me, honey. That sacrificial Passover is officially over. Come on. There is no more that Jesus is going to do. He's done all he's going to do. He spilled all the blood that he could spill. He gave it all. Thank you. So that was on the eve of the 14th, Nisan 14th. We still have the calendar up. On the 15th day of Nisan, which would be the very following day, which would have been a Friday, that was the celebration of the unleavened bread, which we discussed in the last message. We talked about the unleavened bread, how it represented Jesus uh, not having any yeast in it. In other words, he was sinless. There was no corruption in him. And when we looked at the matzah bread, we seen that there were um, burn marks that they call bruises. He was bruised for us. Come on, so there were little pierce holes in it. We know that he was pierced for our transgressions. And we see the stripes down the matzah bread that we looked at in last week's message. By his stripes, huh, we are healed. As Jesus being the middle part, we, show, we showed you the three parts of matzah bread in the unity pouch or the matzah tash. He was taken out. The middle piece was taken out, broken and hidden only for a season, and only to be brought back to the Father, to be ransomed unto the Father. How many in here are thankful today that Jesus ransomed you? Come on, put your hands together and give him a praise. So the Feast of First Fruits is celebrated on the day after the first Sabbath of Passover. Let me say that again. It celebrated the day after the first Sabbath, after Passover. According to Leviticus 23, verse 10. Sabbath is Saturday. The Jews celebrate their Sabbath on a Saturday. More accurately, it begins Friday at twilight, Friday evening until Saturday evening. Even in Judaism today, uh, Passover begins, or I'm sorry, Sabbath begins Friday evening into Saturday evening. So in this case, first fruits would have been Saturday, or I'm sorry, would have been Sunday, Nisan the 17th. So that allows for the prophecy, watch this, to be fulfilled of Jesus being in the grave three days and three nights. If you're tracking with me, please say amen. amen. Thursday night to Friday night. Friday night to Saturday night. Saturday night to Sun. Three days, is everybody with me? Say amen. amen. Three days and three nights. Even as Jesus said, the Son of Man shall be in the earth just as three days and three nights as Jonah was in the belly of a fish. So if Passover, watch this, 
in 32 AD would have been on a Friday instead of Thursday. That would have only allowed Jesus to be in the grave two days and two nights for first fruits. The Word of God would not be perfectly right. If it would have been on a Wednesday, it would have been four days and four nights before first fruits. So, so listen to this, Judah. Watch this. So God, our Father, from the beginning of time, perfectly orchestrated the exact time for Jesus to be crucified, buried, and to rise again from the grave. Galatians 4 and 4 said, said that in the fullness of time, God would set God would send his one and only begotten son. So in the perfection of time, Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity and onto this earth. So pastor, why are you explaining all this to us? Why are you going through every detail? Watch, watch, watch. I'm talking about the prophetic word of God. And the prophetic word of God which constitutes over 25% of your Bible, if you didn't know that. The prophetic word of God is 100% accurate. Amen. If I can show you and convince you of that, then you will learn to trust the entire word of God considering everything in life. Yeah. Why? Because faith, come on, somebody help me, comes by... Hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God. So if you're with me, say amen. So God fulfills His promises, Judah. He will do huh, what He said He will do. Our God is not a man that He should lie. And hear me when I tell you somebody. When He said that He's coming back again, He meant it and He will. Come on, somebody praise Him in the house. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device, or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. So let's take a look at the Feast of First Fruits. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, we just come before you this morning thanking you for your word. We thank you for the revelation that you give us into your word, Father God, that we can see your accuracy. We see your holiness. Father, we thank you, Father, for all that you've done, all that you're doing and all that you're about to do. Father, I pray that you till up the soil in our hearts this morning. Father, that this morning's message would not just be a message of information, but a revelation that will cause transformation in our lives, that we might be transformed even into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And for that, we'll be forever grateful. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the matchless name of Yeshua and all God's people say amen. So as we examine the events leading up to Resurrection Sunday, what does the Bible say about the tomb? What does the Bible say about the tomb? As it's coming into the Resurrection Sunday or the Feast of First Fruits, we discover that certain precautions taken by the enemies of Jesus actually give us circumstantial evidence of his resurrection. Huh. The Bible says some following things about the burial site, first of all, of Jesus. The tomb was a brand new tomb. Never had been used. Never had been occupied. I need my first passage up there, Luke 23 and 53. It says this. If you're taking notes, just write the scripture down because we're going to move through a couple scriptures here. It says, and he took it down, meaning the body of Jesus, and he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one 
had ever lain. So it was a brand new tomb. Listen, church, in those days, it was very commonplace for many bodies to be buried in one tomb. In other words, a whole family could be buried, much like we see in our cemeteries today. We'll see a husband and a wife in the same plots. It was the same thing. So there were many bodies that could have been buried in the tomb, but the tomb that Jesus was in, uh, listen, there was only one in there, so there were no other bodies to be confused with Jesus. Folks couldn't come up with a conspiracy theory and claim that the bodies were switched. Come on, somebody with me here. We're talking about the circumstantial evidence of Jesus Christ coming up out of the grave. There was only one body laid in the tomb. Also, where Jesus was buried was very near the city of Jerusalem. So it was easily accessible for anyone to investigate the burial site. Now there are three major precautions taken at the tomb to assure that it would be secure and tamper-proof. Number one. The Bible says that there would be a large stone rolled in front of the tomb. Matthew 27, 59 and 60, if I could have that up there. The Bible says Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and he went away. Now, this huge stone not only sealed up the tomb, but it would have made it almost impossible, impossible for one person to come and steal the body of Jesus Christ. So what this big stone did was this. Nobody in and nobody out. Mm-hmm. But Jesus. Huh. Number two, there was a Roman seal on the tomb. Matthew 27 and 66, please. The Bible says that there was a Roman seal placed over the tomb. And here's what the scripture reads. And they went and made the grave secure. Along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now the seal was a sign of authentication that the tomb was occupied and the power and authority of Rome stood behind the seal. Anybody found breaking the Roman seal would suffer the punishment of an unpleasant death. So you know how today we see kind of the yellow tape up around crime scenes. You're not allowed beyond that. Well, in that day, they had what was known as the Roman seal. If it was placed on something such as a tomb, you didn't go beyond that seal because it would cost you your life in a very unpleasant manner. Amen? Number three, the guard. The Bible states a guard was appointed to watch Jesus' tomb. Now, this is either a... Roman guard, or it could have been the Jewish temple police. Matthew 27, 65, and 66, please. It states, Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go. Make it as secure as you know how. And they went, and they made the grave secure, along with the guard they set a seal seal on the stone. Now there's a question as to which of the two groups was watching over the tomb of Jesus. Was it the Jewish temple police or the Roman guard? Now the context of the whole uh, uh, death and burial uh, of Jesus Christ, the context seems to favor the Roman guard. Let me tell you a couple of things about this Roman guard. The Roman guard was a 16-man unit that was governed by a very strict set of rules. They would very much be today like our Navy SEALs or our 
green beret. Any one of them could take your life out in a heartbeat. They were trained in warfare. They were a warrior's warrior. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about here. You, in other words, you didn't mess around with the Roman guard just like you wouldn't mess around with a Navy SEAL. Now, each one of these members, remember it was a 16-man unit. Each member was responsible for just six square feet of space. The guard members could not sit down. They could not lean against anything while they were on duty. If a guard member fell asleep on duty, he was beaten, he was burned with his own clothes, but he was not the only one executed. The entire 16-man guard unit was executed. If only one member of that guard unit fell asleep while on duty. So let me ask you a question. If you were on that guard duty, would you make sure that your eyes were awake? Would you make sure that your neighbor's eyes were awake? So I guarantee, I guarantee that nobody in this house would allow their buddy to follow, fall, fall asleep. Are you, if you're with me, say amen. amen. So listen, church, I'm telling you all of this to let you know that this was no typical burial. There was nothing ordinary about it. Nobody went to the magnitude of securing a tomb with a guard unit, with a stone, with a Roman seal. Nobody went to that magnitude, especially, listen to me, for a carpenter from Nazareth turned preacher. A nobody, right? Wrong. Because huh. hear me when I tell you, huh. Jesus was somebody. <laughs> so can you see the extreme measure that these people went through so that the body of Jesus would not be tampered with, let alone come up out of the grave? But I come here today. Huh. I'm here this morning to tell somebody that all of their efforts were in vain because there is no grave on earth that was going to hold down the body of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody, give him a praise in the house. So these precautions made the religious rulers feel secure that the excitement around Jesus would soon go away. It would soon go away. The quote-unquote Jesus movement would dissipate. That's the whole purpose. It's just a movement. Something coming in. Because how many of you know Jesus is not the first one or not the last one who's claimed to be the Christ? Many false Christs came before him. Many false Christs are coming after him. So... This Jesus movement, they felt, would just pass away like every other movement. After all, his body was beaten huh, beyond recognition. The beating that Jesus took would have killed most humans even before getting to the cross at Calvary. Upon hanging on the cross... Jesus spilled every drop of blood in his body. Nobody, nobody can sur survive without blood. So surely he's dead, right? Huh. On the 14th, the 15th, and the 16th of Nisan, Jesus Christ, Laid dead in the tomb. His frightened disciples had scattered 
throughout. They've gone into hiding. The religious rulers, along with the devil himself, thought, thought they had the victory. But I'm here to tell somebody, next up was an event that changed the world because the story wasn't over. The Bible says that early Sunday morning, uh, a certain women, they came to the tomb and uh, to anoint the body of Jesus. However, the stone had been rolled away. The seal had been broken. The body of Jesus Christ was nowhere to be found. There was an angel at the tomb and asked, hey, why do you seek the living among the dead? For Jesus Christ is not here. He's alive and he's alive forevermore. Come on somebody in the house, give God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, it's more than a song we sing, somebody. The Feast of First Fruits. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, please. We're talking about first fruits this morning. We're talking about the feast of the Lord being fulfilled. Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 45. It reads, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, levasakbaktani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus has cried out again in a loud voice, and we know what he said, it is finished. The Bible says he gave up his spirit, verse 51. At that moment, the certain, I'm sorry, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. God huh, coming to earth, somebody. Hmm. The earth shook. The rocks split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came up out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and they went into the holy city and they appeared to many people. So we know that Jesus was crucified on the eve of Passover or Nisan 14th as prescribed by God himself in the book of Exodus. We know that he's the perfect lamb of God. The next day is Nisan 15. It's the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the time when Jesus was buried. Hmm. He was and he is the unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. There's no sin. There's no corruption in him. But church, somebody, thank God for Nisan 17 or the Feast of First Fruits because it's right around the corner for, how many of you know, Sunday's still coming, amen. And we all know what happened that early Sunday morning. So Jesus rises from the dead on the third day, which would be Nisan 17, which is the celebration of the feast of first fruits, just as he declared he would. If you're still tracking with me, somebody say amen in the house. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael, 
on your computer or electronic device, or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. Now the Feast of First Fruits is all about bringing in the very first harvest of your fields during the agriculture year and presenting it to Adonai, presenting your first fruits to God Almighty. During this celebration, the Jews would wave their sheaves uh, as a celebration. Uh, watch this. Watch. They would wave their sheaves of celebration of something that was once the seed dead in the ground. Huh. But now it comes to life again. Oh, my God. Something that was dead in the ground for a season through the winter time but now it's sprung back up out of the ground and is alive again we're talking about first fruits you see jesus was in the ground but somebody thank god it was only for a season and he's now if you don't know this by now the television audience if you don't know this by now he's alive he's up out of the grave so God told the Israelites to give or dedicate to him the first of everything they had. They were supposed to give the first fruit of their crops, the first fruit of their animals, the first fruit of their finance, the first fruit of their children. Remember when Jesus was born, the Bible says Joseph and Mary took him to the synagogue to present him. Because according to Jewish custom, you took your firstborn son to the synagogue to present him as a first fruit. So we see this throughout the Bible. So the original name of this third feast, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, the third feast. However, it contains a great truth. If there are first fruits, then there must be what? Second fruits, third fruits, hundredth fruits, millions of fruits. Listen, that is the true meaning of the celebration of first fruits. Listen to me, Judah. That's some good news. Watch, watch, watch. Because in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we don't merely celebrate the resurrection of our Lord on the Feast of First Fruits, but more so, we celebrate the resurrection of the entire church of Jesus Christ. The fact that the Lord rose from the dead is paramount to the church, to the faith, because without it, it's meaningless. And the resurrection is cause for great wonder and amazement that Jesus came up from the grave. But are we really surprised? Why? 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 He raised others from the grave while he was on earth. He walked on water. He fed thousands with just a couple of fishes and loaves. John wrote that there are not enough books in the world to record all the miracles that Jesus did. But church, listen, here's the greater miracle. That we, ordinary, mortal, earthly sinners, will all rise from the grave one day as well. That, my friend, is something to get happy about. As Paul presented so clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, if you would put that scripture up, Jordan. It says, for as Adam, I'm sorry, for as in Adam all die. Mm -hmm. Even so in Christ, the second Adam shall all be made alive. Watch. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. 
afterward. Is anybody in here a part of that afterward? Anybody? And afterward, they are Christ at his coming. Those in Adam die. Since all descendants of our sinning original father have inherited this terrible tendency, unless the rapture happens, we are all going by the way of the grave. But in Christ, huh? We are made alive again. And this will happen in some given order as the scripture tells us. Watch. Christ is the first fruits. His number was apparently one. Apparently, we all have a number. We will all be raised from the grave in that order. Let me give you another scripture. Watch this. You can put it up there, Jordan. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Huh? With the voice of the archangel. Christ himself is coming to meet us. Let me drop a little nugget here, a little off the trail here, but let me show you something here. Watch this. Jesus Christ is returning for his church. He promised it. Jesus promised it. Not only do we read about Paul writing here, but also in John 14, 3, Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And uh, I will come back and receive you. I will take you under, I will take you unto myself and to that place. Now watch this. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody else has ever, has ever promised to come back and take anybody anywhere. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius, not Gandhi, not Jim Jones, not the Pope, nobody but Jesus. Come on and put your hands together. Nobody made that promise but Jesus. So the Lord shall descend with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. So there's a number. There's an order, church. Then the Bible goes on to say, we who are alive will be caught up. Harpazo in the Greek. A snatching away. That word in the Greek, can I teach a little bit here? Harpazo in the Greek, here's what that word means since we're on this scripture. It means a snatching away from danger. To give you an illustration of that would be like me outside with my four-year-old son and I as the father see him starting to run out on the street. But in my parental vision, I see the big picture. I see the truck barreling down the, oh, come on, somebody with me here. I can see the danger coming, the imminent danger that's coming before this massive truck crushes my child. So what does the father do? He sends his older son, Harpazzo, to snatch the younger brother. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about the rapture here. Because, you see, Father knows the end from the beginning. He sees the tragedy that's coming down. He knows the judgment that's coming to earth. Do you think for one moment this hate 
that is going around our nation and around the world. Do you think this catches our father by surprise? He knows. He knows. Let me be as clear as I can be this morning about what's going on in the world. We are getting ready to move in to a one world order. Chaos is going to break out. Hatred will not decrease. I don't care who gets elected into office. I wish somebody in this house would say amen. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back to take sides. He's coming back to take over somebody. So hear me when I tell you, things are going to get worse. But one day, for the Lord will come down from heaven because Father sees what's going on. He's going to say to his son, Harpazo, go get my church. Get him out of the way. Come on, somebody praise God in this house. So God is a God of order. He's a God of order. Everything is perfectly synchronized. Everything. The universe. Our bodies. Jesus celebrated first fruits in the appropriate manner by rising from the dead on that day, Nisan 17. At that time, he also presented his father with a proper first fruits offering. The Bible says that when Jesus rose, graves were open and dead people rose and they were seen after his resurrection in Jerusalem. We just read that in Matthew chapter 27. Now, could you imagine the astonishment in Jerusalem on that day? <laughs> hey, I, 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 I could have swore... Uncle Levi passed away three years ago. I seen him down at the marketplace. Aunt Betty, hasn't she been dead for like 20 years? But I seen her getting her hair done. Come on, somebody. But they saw the dead people, they rose up from the grave. Could you imagine? You see, our Lord Jesus Christ, not unlike any other farmer of the soil, he gratefully brought before the Father a few early crops, if you will, of what would only be a magnificent harvest later on during the fall harvest. When we read in Matthew chapter 27, with a few dead folk coming up out of the grave. Listen, church, there's a much greater harvest coming of millions. And I don't know about you, but I plan on being a part of that number. Come on, somebody. When God commanded the nation of Israel to offer the first fruits of their harvest, he was asking the nation to make a sacrifice of faith. Pretty much like the tithe concept. When the Word of God teaches about the tithe in Malachi, it's a sacrifice of faith that there would be a harvest. It's a seed and harvest program here. You, are you all with me? It's the same thing, same concept. In other words, God is saying, if you trust me, if you recognize me with your first fruits, baby, wait until you see what I have for you in the fall harvest. 
In the same way, Jesus' resurrection gives us hope that we too will experience the resurrection in the future. For us as believers, the resurrection is not simply a historical event, but also a foretaste of what is to come in the future. When God gives us new, redeemed, glorified bodies. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to trade this one in on a new body. How about you? I can't wait till I can dance without ceasing. Yes, Jesus. Let, let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. Jesus said, we're speaking of first fruits this morning, y'all. Jesus says, if I live, you shall also live. Those he brought forth from the graves represent a type of the church because we too shall be brought forth from our graves for the big fall harvest called the rapture. Also prophetically known as the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, which we are going to speak about next. So let me set up the message for next week. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. It's the same scripture if you could put it up. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet. Somebody say trumpet. With a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. It says, In a flash... Hmm. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, somebody say trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So church, the Feast of Trumpets is the next feast to be fulfilled in the prophetic timeline. So this offering of first fruits by Jesus only means, only means, there is much, much, a much greater harvest coming in the prophetic fall season. And when that trumpet sounds, huh? And when that trumpet sounds, <laughs> be ready. Have your airline ticket in hand. I don't know, maybe there's some in here that are, have, have a fear of flying. <laughs> maybe you have, uh, have never flown in your life. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, <laughs> your first flight will be the greatest flight you've ever taken. Hallelujah. My friend, therein lies the question. Do you have your ticket to eternity. If Jesus were to come calling tonight, if that trumpet sound would happen this very moment, would you go to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air as is proclaimed in the Word of God? You know, one day Jesus promised us that He would return. He would come back for us. And my friend, God keeps his word. Jesus does keep his word. He's coming back for us. Are you ready? You know, you can be ready. It only takes a few minutes just to say a simple prayer with me. Ask Jesus Christ into your life. Would you pray with me today? Just simply say, Lord, today I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I'm a savior. I also realize that I'm going to live for all eternity. 
The only question is, will it be heaven or hell? Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me today for all my sins. I recognize you today as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Come into my life, come into my heart and change me. Give me a new life. I'm tired of trying it myself. Jesus, take over my life. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead and I do confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. My friend, if you've prayed that simple prayer with me, the Bible says that you're saved and that you're born again and you're now filled with God's hilly, Holy Spirit and your all eternity is now secure in Jesus Christ. If you've prayed that prayer with me, we'd love to send you a free gift. It's a CD entitled, I'm Saved, Now What? And basically, it's a teaching on how to now guide you in your new walk with Jesus Christ. To receive this free gift, you could just simply write us at the address on the screen. It's Judah Ministries, 525 Market Street, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, 15132. Or you could simply drop us an email at GoBeyond at judaministries.net that's go beyond at judaministries.net and now if you're ever in the greater pittsburgh area we'd love to have you come and fellowship with us we'd love to meet you come and worship with us whether you wear your sunday best or your favorite pair of blue jeans you will not fill out a place at the judah ministries international worship center we're a multiracial multicultural church and you could come as you are. Once again, the church is located at 525 Market Street, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, 15132. Our services are Sundays at 1030 a.m. And there is always extravagant praise, intimate worship, and the unadulterated preaching of God's holy word. So if you're not able to make it, we sure do hope to see you here next time as together we go beyond. Go beyond to